The following program may contain strong language and brief nudity. But don't get your hopes up. After all, this is Public Access TV. <coughs> this program was made possible from the support of VSA Texas and Amerigroup. You're watching the Gene and Dave Show. Live from Austin, Texas. Well, I'm Gene. And I'm Dave. And we're the Gene, Gene and, and Dave, Dave Show. Show. Dave, I'm excited today. Today I, we... I am too, Gene. Yeah. We're actually in the Capitol. We're in the Capitol, <laughs> and we're not under arrest this time. <laughs> <laughs> and we're interviewing Ron Lucy, who's the executive director of the Texas... Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with the legendary Gene and Dave from the <laughs> Gene and Dave Show. And that's quite a title you got, Ron. It, it really is. Do you put that on one business card or two? <laughs> it's a wraparound title. I, I see. <laughs> Great. Ron, you're the uh, executive director now of the Governor's Committee on uh, People with uh, Disabilities. This committee has been in existence since, what, the 50s or so? Since the 1950s, uh, when Governor Shivers, uh, Ellen Shivers, uh, officially enacted the committee. So. Okay, great. Um, I've got to tell you, I haven't heard a lot about this committee. Can you tell us what the committee does? Yeah, the committee has uh, several core functions which are uh, enacted in the Human Resources Code. and. We have, when we talk about the committee, we're talking about both our committee members and our staff. The governor appoints 12 committee members. Seven of those must be people with disabilities. And then we also have our ex officio members, which represent the major state agencies that serve Texans with disabilities, like the Health and Human Services Commission. Uh, used to be DARS was on there, but now that they've merged with the Texas Workforce Commission, TWC, and vocational rehabilitation. Uh, some exciting news this month, we're adding the Texas Education Agency as an ex officio member, so we're very proud to have their contributions. We have the Department of Family and Protective Services, uh, Department of Aging and Disability Services, and then also the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation and DSHS. Uh, our major work is to recommend, uh, to provide policy recommendations to the Texas legislature. Uh, every even numbered year, we will uh, develop a biennial policy report. We cover 10 core issue areas. Uh, we have a small staff, uh, myself and four staff members, uh, and we will do the research for the committee members, but we take direction from them on which way to go. Uh, those policy issue areas are pretty broad. We have, uh, uh, for example, access, uh, which can include accessibility mm -hmm. in the built environment, and right now we're doing work on accessible parking study. Uh, we have Communications, which can cover effective communications, uh, access for people who are deaf, uh, making sure that uh, captioning in American Sign Language is available. Uh, also, something that I know Mr. Dauber is uh, very active in, and that's uh, 
accessible information and communication technology, making sure that websites are accessible for people to use assistive technology. Uh, we also deal with education issues for both K through 12 education and higher education. And uh, having TEA on our committee as an ex officio is gonna help us be more effective. In fact, uh, one of our committee members is a principal from the Rosedale School, so. Uh, then we also deal with emergency management, and this may not be a topic that you've heard a lot about, but uh, my predecessor, Angie English, was uh, very passionate about uh, emergency management and helping both Texans with disabilities prepare for all kinds of emergencies, but also helping the emergency management community, uh, both the state operations center and local emergency managers, include the needs of Texans with disabilities and their emergency plans. And it's, it's interesting, as a state, you go back over a decade, and at that time we had shelter plans to deal with evacuating families and their pets, but we didn't have shelter plans to deal with the accessibility or the access and functional needs of people with disabilities. So we've come a long way. Uh, and I really respect the work that my predecessors did on that. Uh, we also deal with housing issues uh, and uh, issues related to veterans. And then finally, workforce, oh, transportation. Uh, a couple years ago, the committee did a uh, substantial study on paratransit. And then, of course, workforce, which is, includes uh, employment of people with disabilities. Uh, you may have heard of some of our award programs. We have uh, our National Disability Employment Awareness Month poster contest, and mm -hmm. we have, uh, I think, the most fantastic art collection in the state of Texas uh, of art that's created by Texans with disabilities. And we have uh, a panel of esteemed judges that judge the art, and the winning artist with a disability gets to have their art placed on our poster that goes out statewide with the national slogan for uh, National Disability Employment Awareness Month. This year's poster is by an artist who's deaf, and it's a really neat poster. I'll be sure to get both of you one of them. Oh, great. Um, uh, a girl with butterflies in her hair, and she's uh, using the American Sign Language sign for butterflies. Uh, we have a Barbara Jordan Media Award, uh, which I know the Gene and Dave show will aspire to uh, win someday. Keep trying, guys. Uh, and this is, uh, I think we have to submit an application you, you first. Or, or somebody would have to nominate no, you. But uh, there's been some tremendous journalists uh, that have been recognized in uh, the Barbara Jordan Media Award. Uh, this year, Bob Phillips from Texas Country Reporter uh, was one of them. Uh, uh, Elon Stevens from KUT did a really good spot on the Employment First Task Force and people working in sheltered workshops for less than minimum wage. Uh, there was a, an excellent book by a parent of a child with developmental disability uh, called Meredith and Me. Um, and uh, her name is Sarah Barnes. She's a, uh, used to have a syndicated column in the Austin American Statesman. So the media awards were, in recent years, we've partnered with uh, the colleges of journalism and communications at different universities around the state. This past year, we were up at the University of Texas at Arlington, and that went really well. And then uh, in October, during National Disability Employment Awareness Month, we hold our annual Lex Frieden Employment Awards, and I'm sure both of you know Mr. Lex Frieden. Uh, many people, uh, are cited as being involved in helping with the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and Lex Frieden was certainly one of them. He was at the White House signing ceremony and uh, did a lot of background work, and so the committee uh, honored Mr. Lex Frieden by naming our annual employment awards after him. We uh, have a lot, lot of activities. We could go on and on, but I, I want to make sure that you get all your questions in. Uh, well, do, and I'm already tired of hearing about yeah, what yeah. you do, Ron. <laughs> Well, it's not what I do, it's what my hardworking staff do and uh, what our committee does. And so, uh, we're very proud. And oh, see, we got it wrong. We thought you did all the work and the committee took all the uh, credit. Oh, uh, well, it's a team effort. <laughs> Is it? Okay. I have to say one of our uh, guiding principles, uh, a value that I've had throughout my career is to work with partners. And uh, one of the examples uh, is one that, uh, an effort that Mr. Dauber has contributed to that uh, we, on the governor's website, we have uh, Microsoft Office accessibility training videos. Mm -hmm. And uh, last time we updated those was in 2012. And it was a collaboration between 13 different state agencies. And these videos train people on how to make 
common Microsoft Office documents and emails, Excel spreadsheets successful so that people with disabilities that use assistive technology have equal access to that information. Those videos have been so tremendously popular, they've been accessed all over the country and all over the world. And wow. now this uh, same collaboration of agencies led by our friends at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality is updating those videos uh, for uh, versions of Office 2013 and 2016. And I've always held the belief that the taxpayer shouldn't have to pay for the same good idea more than once. Mm -hmm. And so if uh, one state agency is working on something that could benefit the people they serve and their employees, why not share in, in that effort and share those resources and collaborate between agencies. So that's kind of another unique focus of the governor's committee is we look across the state and we see what's going on and we try to bring people together to collaborate to solve problems uh, uh, across those silos. Uh, make sure we learn from each other too with those best practices. Would you ever address the legislature and say, we think this particular bill is very important. Uh, uh, if there was a particular bill that... Yeah. Um, well, that's an interesting question. As a, a state employee, I may be called on to serve as a resource witness to the Texas legislature. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, in the last session, they passed a bill that tasked the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities to study the issue of, uh, they said, handicap parking. We like, like to call it accessible parking. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of October, we have to turn in a report to the uh, Texas legislature on our findings. And so I, as a state employee, cannot uh, testify in favor or against any legislation. But I can certainly mm -hmm. come before the legislature and answer their questions. And, uh, provide them with factual information to help them make decisions. Now, just as any citizen can do, I can take vacation time, and if there's something I'm passionate about, I can uh, take off my executive director badge and come up here and testify just as you can. But uh, I, I think I'll have my hands full during the session just answering questions on the policy recommendations. Uh, our policy recommendations uh, are developed by our committee members, and uh, the staff do the background research to try to bring them the best information to help shape those policies. But uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, with the legislature, but I have another guiding principle that I've brought to my leadership of the Governor's Committee. Uh, I believe that Texans with disabilities can hope for legislative solutions, but they can work often for administrative solutions. And what I mean by that is a lot of times there's enough laws on the books to already accomplish many of the things that we want to do. And uh, a lot of the state agencies already have the statutory authority uh, to accomplish great things for the people of Texas. And so it's working with those agencies, with that agency leadership to say, there's something that you could do differently or do more of or adjust mm -hmm. your approach, make things more accessible. And those are the sort of opportunities that I get excited about because as you know, in the state of Texas, the legislature only meets every two years. Uh, but uh, state agencies function 365 days a year, and I view that as an endless opportunity to make positive change for Texans with disabilities. So do you have an example or a story where that's worked? Absolutely. Uh, we have fantastic partners, and one of those unsung heroes this year is the Department of Public Safety. And you don't often think of a law enforcement agency as being an agency that does great things for Texans with disabilities, but they've mm. demonstrated a lot of leadership this year. One area that they demonstrate leadership on is with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. Uh, they formulated a Texas Disability Task Force on Emergency Management, and I was the first chair of that task force. And that's the group that has developed some tools uh, for emergency managers to help better meet the uh, emergency preparedness, response and recovery needs of Texans with disabilities. And so we're working with them to update some of those tools. Another thing that they did, and once again, they looked at their statutory authority and said, we don't need a bill to be passed to do this. We're just gonna do this because it's the right thing, is they partnered with uh, a great nonprofit organization called Asperger's 101 and with the Governor's Committee on a Driving with Autism Initiative. And uh, as you know, autism is a spectrum. You have people with varying levels of ability, and right. many individuals with autism 
uh, who are high functioning can get a driver's license. But they may have an impediment uh, to communicating effectively with a law enforcement officer if they get pulled over. So this Driving with Autism initiative is an initiative with DPS where we've been able to get them to allow an individual to put a, a code on their driver's license, their Texas driver's license, that indicates that that driver has a uh, communication impediment with a peace officer. And it's entirely voluntary. Oh. And so to paint a scenario for you, if uh, a state trooper is driving down the highway and they see a car that's having some problems uh, and they get ready to pull that person over, often they'll interrogate the license plate with their onboard computer system called TLATS. And the code that indicates that this is a driver that has autism or a communication impediment can pop up. And that will allow them to kick in their training. If we just stopped with that, that wouldn't be enough. But working with DPS, we've uh, and with Asperger's 101, who did much of the heavy lifting through uh, Miss Jennifer Allen, who's a mom who has a teenage son with autism, they've developed some fantastic training resources for police officers. And I'll give you an example. Uh, often in heated situations, we'll resort to idioms or sarcasm for communication, like, why were you flying down the road? Or, Where's the fire? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a person with autism may not understand those idioms and say, well, officer, I don't know where the fire is, or I wasn't flying, I was driving. And you could imagine that things could get off on the wrong foot. Sure. And so uh, by training law enforcement officers on uh, interacting with people with autism, letting them know in advance before they pull somebody over um, that this is a driver that may have autism, uh, those are a couple of things that we can do to avoid those misunderstandings. And if that was all that DPS was doing, that would be pretty amazing, but they took it even further. Up in Florence, Texas, we have a tactical training center, and this is where DPS troopers uh, learn how to do their uh, driving when they're doing pursuit driving or evasive driving. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty amazing tactical center, and they've turned that tactical center over uh, for a day of uh, driver training for drivers with autism. They're doing a kind of a uh, one day trial of it uh, this fall and uh, going to work out the kinks on it and then uh, hold it a couple times a year where they invite uh, young drivers with autism from around the state to uh, learn how to feel more safe and secure in their skills and how to interact with law enforcement officers. And each one of the drivers will have a one on one. Uh, DPS trooper uh, coaching them during that uh, day of uh, driving camp. So this is something that the legislature didn't say, you guys have to do this. This is something where they're in enlightened leadership. They saw a problem, they saw a challenge, and they said, we can help with this. And I see endless opportunities for that sort of innovation and uh, people of goodwill wanting to make the lives of Texans with disabilities better. Well, that's great, and that's a great example to other agencies around the state. I, I hope they do follow that example. Um, now, Ron, you mentioned this um, uh, accessible parking survey. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yes, I can. Uh, this was um, an issue that was brought to the Texas legislature by uh, a mom who has a daughter with a developmental disability, uh, an adult uh, child, and uh, she has encountered numerous parking challenges uh, in her day-to-day -day life. And the one that most often occurs is when she's trying to find van accessible parking, uh, especially at hospitals and medical clinics where the kind of people that go to hospitals are people that are more likely to need accessible parking. Right. Uh, they'll, her daughter cannot be left alone, uh, so unloading at the curb is not a good option. And mm -hmm. so when she comes to park in the uh, van accessible parking spots already full. She has to circle or schedule a different appointment or uh, other options they've had is getting a second wheelchair that folds up to go into a sedan, hire an attendant. I mean, go to extraordinary lengths. To and the ADA has a certain number of, and you know, they say like how many parking spots That's that correct. you should have for a parking lot. You know, like. Yeah. What is it, 5% or whatever, for right. example? It's 1 in 25. Uh, okay, so 1 so, in 25. Yeah. But when you're in a hospital setting, you've got 50 parking spots. So that means you've got two wheelchair spots. Yeah. Or two accessible and, uh, parking spots. So which clearly would not be enough at a hospital setting where yeah. you've got 20 or 30 patients a day. 
coming in that need those those handicap parking spots. Yeah. We're looking at some innovative solutions for how to address this. Uh, in addition to looking at our existing laws here in the state, we're also looking at the laws of all 50 states all in around the country, and some of them have come up with some pretty unique ideas for addressing it. This week uh, and next week, we're uh, conducting an accessible parking survey on our Governor's Committee Survey Monkey site, and we've sent out the survey to independent living centers, vocational rehabilitation offices, local mayor's committees, uh, community rehabilitation providers, everybody we know and can think of, ADA coordinators, and uh, we're hoping the Gene and Dave show will also uh, share this with the audience. Uh, now, if you ask me to recite the URL of the survey, I'm not going to be able to do that, so we may have to add that in post-production. It's, it's on the bottom of the screen, folks. Perfect. Just on the bottom, right, right here. Right there. Right there. Popped up. Just like that. Magic of editing. But I'm excited about this survey because it's, uh, it's looking at some challenging issues. We're uh, talking to veterans about uh, their concerns. Uh, we also held a public hearing earlier this summer at our August quarterly meeting and had a really good turnout of a lot of parking advocates, uh, and so we're getting input in that way as well. And then uh, when we do go to the legislature with our recommendations, we can anticipate that they'll want to know what the business community thinks. And so we're working on a second survey that's going to go out either Friday oh. afternoon or on Monday to talk to business owners that own parking lots and strip malls and that sort of thing about uh, their issues and concerns so we can provide a balanced report. But already we're seeing some low-hanging low fruits, some easy solutions. One of the things we learned from the state of Kansas is that their Bureau of Vital Statistics is talking to their Department of Motor Vehicles and sharing information to make sure that dead people don't apply for uh, parking placards. Very uh, they important. They had a yeah. remarkable number of dead people that were getting uh, disabled parking hang tags or license plates. And uh, by sharing data on uh, death certificates, it really cuts down on the dead getting accessible mm -hmm. parking. Uh, we found out from our friends at uh, Travis County Precinct 5 that uh, it's, uh, there are people selling parking placards on Craigslist. They go uh, for about 160 to 180 dollars, depending on the expiration date. We also found out that that's not illegal. Okay, so tell me again about the placards. What do you want to know? Placards are legal to sell, right? Well, it's legal, but it ain't 100 percent legal. I mean, you can't just roll into some parking spot and jump out of your ride. I mean, they want you to have a real disability to use the actual spot. And those come from the doctor? Yeah, it, it breaks down like this, okay? It's legal to buy it, and it's legal to own it. And if you're the proprietor of a placard, it's legal to sell it. But it's illegal for the guy that bought it from you to use it for parking in a disabled spot. But if you sold it, <laughs> that doesn't matter, because get a load of this. The guy that bought it from you gets busted. Oh, man. I'm selling mine. That's all there is to it. I'm selling. I know, baby. You dig it the most. <laughs> But I've wow. often held the belief that if you have four people in a room that are reasonable and all four of them agree that there ought to be a law against that, it's likely that the legislature is going to agree as well. So that's another example of low-hanging fruit. Uh, we've seen some model uh, education programs. Uh, parking campaigns that educate the public. In the state of Colorado, we found that they were able to reduce uh, parking violations of people that were illegally parked in accessible parking through a, a simple sign. It, uh, the sign said, think of me and keep it free. And it had a picture of kind of a grandmotherly looking woman who used one of those walkers that has the handbrakes in the seat mm. that you can sit down in. And there's something about seeing somebody that reminds you of your own grandmother that makes you want to do the right thing. Uh, and they've tried a lot of other campaigns, but that one actually hit a bullseye. And anytime you can solve 50% of a problem with a sign, uh, there's not too many things you can solve 50% of with a sign, but I thought that was pretty impressive. Oh, that is impressive. Um, but I tell you, Dave and I both have accessible vans, and I think we've both seen abuse in the uh, use of accessible parking, but. Um, I'm thinking one way we can cut down on this is the application form. I'm thinking, why not just make it available to people with mobility impairments? 
Right now, anyone with any sort of disability can get a handicap uh, parking placard. That's not entirely true, but it is an extensive list. Uh, for example, people who are legally blind can get uh, an accessible parking permit because often uh, crossing the vast expanse of an open parking lot mm -hmm. with a white cane uh, can be challenging. However, people who are deaf, unless they have a secondary disability, are not automatically eligible for an accessible parking hang tag. What we are seeing is there's the people that have vans are saying van accessible spots should be only available to people that have a van. And that's possibly a good recommendation. But with small businesses, if you're a mm. small doctor's office or dentist's office or clinic, you may only have one accessible parking spot. And if it's a van accessible parking spot and somebody else comes up who has osteoarthritis or a heart condition uh, where they can't walk very far, or have limited mobility, but don't use a van, they use a sedan, uh, then should we tell them they can't park there? And that's going to be one of the most challenging issues to address. Likewise, we see with DV plates, disabled veterans can get a DV plate, and uh, they may have a disability like post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. which may not impinge on their ability to uh, park. And so there may be some opportunities to tighten up on that. We also see that the length of time that you can get a temporary disability placard seems to be often longer than the healing process for a typical broken leg or that sort of thing. Remarkably, we found that there's, I think the number was 5 million parking placards and license plates out there in the state of Texas. Oh, geez. It's on par with the number of people with disabilities in the state, but when you talk about the number of people with disabilities, we're talking people with intellectual disabilities, autism, deafness, blind, all disabilities. And as you correctly stated, not all disabilities need accessible parking. So that number is so large because it includes people that have a temporary need for that parking. Mm. And I think doctors uh, who are in the business of not only providing health care but pleasing their patients may often be quick to hand those out. Uh, yes, yes. If we had time to do a third study, we might uh, survey doctors, but I'm not sure that we what kind of information we could get out of them because I think they're going to do what they're going to do or what they think is in the best interest of their patient. They're advocating for the interest of their patients. They're not advocating for what's in the, necessarily the best interest of the state at large. Right. And that's the kind of doctor I'd want to have, frankly, but uh, it does have issues around doing yeah, that. And it's definitely a, a hard subject to to take on because it's it's big and it's in every town and city you know all over the country and you know every city has their population but it's great that you're allowing you've got this survey out there that's on the web which is also accessible for people Absolutely. um i checked it out today and i completed the survey myself Thank so you. uh you know it's great to go out there and you know be able to get people's opinions and you know a lot of times people will complain and complain about this and that and now you're you're giving them a voice a place to put your check and your ideas and i noticed you know there was also a lot of places to well there was a lot of check marks and you know different values that you can put on things a lot of radio buttons you know you pick this pick that but you also had uh, areas for comment absolutely so that if people wanted to describe something or explain something or you know give their ideas to the committee that those could be taken down as well. Um, they can even send us an email and attach pictures if they want. Our, our email address is gcpd at gov.texas.gov. And so beyond just taking a survey, they can give us a call or send us an email and share even more information if they want. So one other issue that we're studying is parking here at the Capitol. Uh, oh, excuse me, Ron, before yeah. we go on to that, um, some people may not understand this, but if you have a relative who has a disability and they get a placard, that doesn't mean you can leave that person at home and go run your errands with that placard and park in accessible parking spots. It's not for that. It's only when you're transporting that family member. That's absolutely correct. And, and I think a lot in, in the survey even you mentioned is, is education, is more education needed, which yeah. I agree, yeah, it probably is for you know people that are getting their driver's license or an education for people that have a placard yeah. or a plate. You know, educate people that 
maybe you should yield to the places marked van accessible. You know, if if yeah, if that's the last accessible parking spot, take it. But if not, please allow someone that uses a van that needs that extra space out to the side to, to park there first. One one other aspect of my career. Uh, Part of my leadership style is systems thinking. And I, I like to look at problems from a systemic standpoint from end to end and see where are those natural gates where you can uh, most effectively address a problem. And with a lot of problems, there are multiple areas where you could impact it. And one of the uh, education target areas we're looking at is the Texas Driver's Handbook for young drivers who are getting their license for the first time. If we can educate them on accessible parking, mm -hmm. uh, Hopefully, we can influence them for a lifetime uh, about Great. the importance of keeping that spot open. So we, all, all those types of suggestions are going to be in our report, and uh, we're hoping that the legislature will pick and choose the ones that uh, they uh, think will best address the problem. And uh, the ones that uh, can be addressed administratively without a change in law, I think those are going to be easy ones to implement in the state of Texas. Yeah, Dave and I take this issue very seriously and and I've got some training through the constable's office so I can write tickets for folks that are illegally parked. Here at the Capitol we had a meeting last week with the Texas Facilities Commission, the Department of Public Safety and the State Preservation Board to study parking here at the Capitol which is the people's building. This is uh, very important that uh, any citizen who wants to come to testify here at the Capitol be able to do so and have access to parking to do so. And we know that it's also an important building to remain secure. It's got a, an extensive security perimeter around it. So mm -hmm. the parking is a little bit further away often. Uh, but we're looking also at innovative ways of addressing that, including uh, looking at a completely accessible drop-off area uh, or a valet area where uh, it has good overhead cover to protect you from the weather and the sun and the rain, uh, has uh, good curb cuts and a uh, uh, good flat surface, good accessible path of travel to the accessible side of the Capitol. Uh, and that could be just one thing that we add to the Capitol grounds because we know there's never going to be completely enough parking here. Uh, but we're also looking at policies uh, with human resources departments where we can encourage employees to park in assigned parking garages and leave the uh, metered spots for people with disabilities or for visitors or guests. Often we're seeing that employees are parking out on the curb or the street and uh, when citizens want to come here to the Capitol, there's nothing left for them. So that's something we think might be able to be addressed by a human resources policy change uh, and not necessarily require a change in state law. So once again, looking at the innovative and most effective ways to address those issues. Well, you certainly got your work cut out for you. And uh, I was looking at your committee members, um, Aaron Banger. Well, everybody in the state knows Aaron. Uh, Aaron is great. We're so lucky to have him as our chair. Fantastic leadership, uh, a brilliant mind, works at a fantastic uh, employer, AT&T, who is uh, both gets it in terms of employing people with disabilities and gets it in terms of accessibility. Yeah. ka -ching. But uh, no, we're, we really appreciate having Aaron as our chair. Uh, and uh, we have some good diversity on our committee right now. Uh, and that's really what it takes. When you think about disabilities, although uh, the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities is the only state agency that looks at uh, disability issues from a cross disability standpoint, uh, and looks at both state and federal laws. Uh, we understand that disability is not a monolithic uh, condition or group. It's a very diverse group. You've got uh, disabilities that happen at different ages. You have sensory disabilities and physical disabilities. And in fact, the biggest group of people with disabilities are people that don't even regard themselves as having a disability. I, I remember on the 10th anniversary of the ADA, the American Association of People with Disabilities asked me to go talk to different community groups and I went to a, an adult Sunday school class at uh, a church here in Austin and there were lots of scooters, lots of canes, lots of walkers, lots of hearing aids, lots of very thick glasses, but not a single person with a disability in the room. <laughs> and what I mean by that is they explained to me that 
you know, they appreciated the information I had to share and that they just had a few challenges to work around. Uh, but uh, I think there's a lot of people in the population that benefit from accessibility and don't always understand that when we're talking about accessibility for Texans with disabilities, we're talking about them, we're talking about the, their family members. So it's probably one of the biggest minority groups in the nation in terms of uh, consider its impact on individuals and then on families. Uh, easily one in three families has uh, a person with a disability in it. And if that disability is uh, severe, it could mean a change in housing, uh, maybe even change in location um, where you live. So uh, we're glad to have you at the helm, Ron. Well, thank you. Your work at the Mayor's Committee is well known, so uh, very yeah, much appreciated here. I think that was the best boot camp training I could get for a job mm -hmm. like this. I, I view all, ultimately all disability and accessibility issues are local issues because we all live in uh, towns, villages, communities, cities, and when we think of issues that are not state of Texas capital issues that need to be solved. A lot of them are issues that can be solved locally. Uh, and that's the other opportunity we see. We work with a network of 44 mayor's committees and county committees, and not all of the problems can be solved by the Texas legislature, nor should they. Uh, mm. A lot of advocates need to work with their city council and their uh, county commissioners or uh, uh, county judges to make sure that ordinances are being passed locally. I, I remember a lot of great work from the mayor's committee, including uh, the visitability ordinance that passed oh, yeah. a few years ago that requires that all construction of new single family homes in Austin have five basic accessibility tenants. And as we see those sort of laws getting passed in Austin, there's no reason why that can't happen in Lubbock or Fort Worth, Plano. So our, our goal is to in the coming years, strengthen that network of mayor's committees and learn from each other and make sure that uh, the advocates have the information they need to affect change in their own community. How's and having, having said that, um, when, should be, when, when should people contact the governor's committee? Um, at, at what point in their, you know, when they're, when they're struggling with the law or something like that and they want you know, they want some action or they want some, they need something to happen. Yeah. Um, or, you know, they just want to bring it up to somebody. When should they go to their local? When should they go to the governor's committee? Sure. And then after that, tell us how to get in contact with the yeah. governor's committee. Well, based on how often our phone rings and our inbox fills up, it appears that they're contacting us every day. But, uh, <laughs> uh, information and referral is a large component of what we do. We have an accessibility and disability rights coordinator, Ms. Randy Turner, uh, and uh, she does a lot of research on what I'd refer to as a lot of the very challenging uh, issues. We often get people when they've been entirely at the end of their rope. They've already worked locally, uh, either with their local school district on a special education issue or on an accessibility barrier uh, in their neighborhood, in, in their city or town, and they're not making progress. And if they contact us, we'll put them in touch with other state level resources, Disability Rights Texas, uh, the people that handle the complaints at the Texas Department of License and Reg Licensing and Regulation. We can also get them in contact with federal uh, resources with the U.S. Department of Justice uh, and uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. But we also track these calls and emails that we get because those uh, contacts from the public tell a story. They help us guide uh, and inform the committee on policy issues that they need to be looking at. So in aggregate, all of those calls uh, help us better guide the state of Texas. And in terms of information and referral, we do a pretty good job of helping them troubleshoot. I, I often try to tell my staff there's not enough of us to provide case management mm -hmm. because we feel very emotionally involved with the people that call our office and we want to try to fix it for them and uh, we've, we've certainly sometimes taken it further than anybody would reasonably expect. Uh, one of my employees was saying, you know, I want to go help this woman. She can't drive for the next three months and I want to help her go get her vehicle registered and inspected. And, uh, so uh, I'm very proud of my staff. They're very caring and very committed to the job that they do of providing information and referral and helping the people of Texas. Uh, I always believe in starting local. 
uh, but often people just don't know where to go. Uh, we keep a database of ADA coordinators for cities and counties and also for universities. And uh, Not every city or county's ADA coordinator, if you type in that word in Google, you're not necessarily going to find one. And so we've done the hard work and the heavy lifting of trying to identify those individuals so we can often just, if they contact us, we'll guide them back to a, a resource. So can we find that on your website? We Not everything's on our website. Our website's a work in progress, but we do have a key laws and resources page on our website, and I encourage people to check that out. The key laws and resources are grouped by a topic like uh, emergency preparedness, housing, access, uh, ADA. They also have lists of uh, state laws. Uh, and uh, no, we, we haven't published the list of all the ADA coordinators, but that's a good idea, and that's something we can work towards. So, okay. And how's your um, support from up above, from the governor? You uh, know, yeah. uh, he's got a disability. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that. Uh, yeah. my, my first encounter with uh, Governor Greg Abbott was when he was uh, Supreme Court Justice Greg Abbott, and uh, it was on the 10th anniversary of the ADA, and we were doing a torch relay. Uh, this was the ADA torch that was lit at the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta and making its way across the country. And we wanted to light the Austin torch on the grounds of the Capitol. And at the time, the Capitol Preservation Board didn't want open flames on Capitol grounds. And so oh. I remember calling Supreme Court Judge Greg Abbott and asking if we could have the torch lighting ceremony on the grounds of the Supreme Court, which was exactly 12 inches away from the Capitol grounds. <laughs> and he was very gracious and said, absolutely, yes. Uh, I'm fortunate in that my uh, direct supervisor is the deputy chief of staff, Mr. Robert Allen, and uh, he's got a direct line to Governor Abbott, and we have a fantastic working relationship. Uh, the governor's executive team is very committed to uh, serving Texans with disabilities. In fact, this month, uh, the entire executive leadership team is participating in something called Archer's Challenge. I don't know if you've heard about that. Uh, Archer Hadley is one of our committee members. He's a oh, young man yes. with cerebral palsy who's on the board yeah. of Easter Seals, also an Eagle Scout, uh, which I appreciate since my kids and I are in, into Boy Scouts. But uh, Archer has challenged uh, Governor Abbott's staff to participate in the Archer, uh, Archer's Challenge to spend a day in a wheelchair, uh, which uh, will uh, help them understand how important access it is. So, have they accepted that uh, Absolutely, challenge? absolutely. They're wow. going to do it. On October 12th, uh, you'll see uh, many, many members of the executive staff uh, all participating in the Archer's Challenge. I'm not sure where they're getting all the wheelchairs from, but uh, it's, I'm really impressed. I'm going to keep an eye on mine. I don't yeah. want it to go missing. <laughs> but October 12th is a busy day. It's also the day we're observing White Cane Day on the campus of the School for the Blind. Our, uh, Staff have been invited to give a National Disability Employment Awareness Month proclamation and participate in some awards recognition and best drop for a group of uh, veterans who work at the Federal Department of Corrections and best drop. I was really impressed. 25% of their employees are employees with disabilities. So uh, Fantastic. Yeah. And we expect the tempo of activity in October to remain that busy every day in October. As you know, it's National Disability Employment Awareness Month, Texas Disability History Awareness Month, Disability Mentoring Day, White Cane Day. Uh, so. well, well, of course we knew that, didn't we, Dave? That's right. Oh, you're the Gene and Dave show. Yeah. So. Good luck finding a parking spot on October 12th. Yes. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, um, Ron, Dave and I were discussing another um, possible law. I mean, since your office serves the disabled, sure. how about free beer for people with disabilities like well, every Saturday maybe I don't know as you know I'm flexible in, on in my official role uh, as a state employee I cannot advocate in favor or against any law but I could provide resource testimony if you wanted to buy the first round mm -hmm. and I were able to sample it and see what mm -hmm. this free beer tasted like uh, so that would be a pleasure for me to participate in, in that with you guys sometime uh, to mm -hmm. enjoy a glass of beer Austin is famous for lots of uh, artesian handcrafted mm -hmm. beers and uh, so uh, I don't know that that's the solution the legislature needs to get involved in but uh, so bartenders listen up and people with disabilities this is how you start a law <laughs> you start a conversation you do testing on it and uh, 
This and I'll so have to participate in that test with you after 5.30. <laughs> Very well. All right, is there anything else you'd like to add, uh, let our audience know? Well, I just want to say how much I appreciate the legendary Gene and Dave show. Uh, you all have been at this for a while and consistently doing a great job, and, and you bring a lot of fun to uh, the topic of disability inclusion. Uh, pretty excited to hear that you're, you now have an international audience, so that's impressive. Keep up the good work. Thank, thank you, and thanks for your support. We really appreciate you telling us all about the Governor's Committee for People with Disabilities and um, all the work that you're doing. It's uh, amazing. You've got a lot on your plate, and you know, as a person with a disability, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Same here. All right. Thank you, Ron, and we'll catch you next time on the Gene and Dave Show. Bye now. Good deal. Well, if you've learned anything from the Gene and Dave show, you'll learn that you don't say anything bad about the government.